Thanks, Patty, and thanks, uh, Frank, for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to try and do this in 21 minutes or 20 minutes. I have 40 slides, so if you don't see my slides flicking every 30 seconds, please give me a warning. We're, we're behind. So I want to talk about eco-innovation. And this is a journey from when Eamon Ryan actually uh, convened the first climate <coughs> gathering in, in February in, in Ballyvaughan. Our thinking has moved on. And I shared some of these thoughts at the last climate gathering in, in Dublin. So hopefully there's been some progression. Um, Plan C for a, a low carbon digital society, or digital low carbon society, what does that mean? Before I get to that, just innovation really matters. Um, since the Second World War, 75% of GDP growth in the US came from innovation. I think that's quite staggering. Uh, the same for all of the Western economies. And um, one question is, of course, we've seen sort of quality of life uh, grow, GDP grow, uh, but have we been able to do that innovation sustainably? So that, that's just a, a question. I'll come back to that in, in, in a second. Um, in terms of sustainability in businesses, we can think of a couple of aspects. You know, one obvious one is actually, is the business sustainable? Will my business still be here in five years or 10 years? And what we see in the Fortune 500 is the half-life of companies in the Fortune 500 continues to drop. So businesses are less and less sustainable. There are many companies that 10 years ago were in the Fortune 500 that are now don't exist, Kodak, Polaroid. So we need to think about that. And as we think about innovation, we know that it's changing, that the unit of competition is no longer an individual scientist or an individual company or an individual university. It's actually the eco ecosystem that we participate in or the eco ecosystem we direct. And in the context of the climate gathering or the earth gathering, we have to think about if we're going to drive structural change together, it's not going to be one university or one company. It's going to be an entire ecosystem. And that ecosystem will actually have to include the users and the citizens. And I, th I thought Pat gave a really great talk and you know, very inspiring. Uh, but one of the things we've been talking about in Plan C is, well, how do we get those people that aren't really inclined to think about climate adaption or mitigation, how do we get them on board? And that's what Plan C is about. Um, Patty mentioned we do have this network in Europe, and it's quite extensive. We can do a lot. It's actually a big opportunity. It's a big responsibility. But in terms of actually Intel being a sustainable uh, business, and uh, we, we want to be around in 10 years, 20, 30 years' time. It's all about the ecosystem that we participate in. and. One of my tasks is to try and get an ecosystem that shares the same vision as we do, that helps amplify our efforts and we amplify partners' efforts, and we can accelerate together. So if we're going to make a significant collective change on global sustainability, I think this is an approach that you know, would be well worth thinking about. Um, Intel's approach in general, um, very simply, three different levels. Firstly, we try and pursue a gentler footprint to our, our worldwide operations. Lots of things that we're proud of. One in the US, we're the largest purchaser of green electric power. Uh, here in Ireland, we use a lot of water, but all of the water that um, comes into our plant leaves quite a bit cleaner. We design energy efficient products. And really pleased, some of you may have heard the announcement of Quark, Intel Quark. It's Intel's in Internet of Things processor. It's probably their most significant product announcement that we've made in the last five to 10 years. It's 100% designed in Ireland. You know, it's 10 times smaller and five times more energy efficient than our, our current Atom pro processor. So we're, we're trying to do our bit in terms of you know, bringing more and more energy efficient products to the market. But where we can really have an impact is using our products and using lots of information technology products uh, to change the footprint um, of our operations, of, of people's business operations and the way our society runs. Sustainable development, the Brundtland Report, it was about how can we be prosperous today but ensure there are enough resources available in the future so the future generations can be prosperous. So I've underlined the word here, patterns. Patterns are hugely important. So what are the patterns of behavior, the patterns of resource consumption that can enable future generations to prosper? I want to use a quote from Seneca, um, a stoic uh, Roman philosopher. Fortunately, he met a very sad end. Uh, but he said, the way is long if you follow precepts or rules. The way is short if you follow patterns. So as we come to this solution or try and architect a solution for a future sustainable world, we have to create patterns and we have to embed these sustainable patterns into, into solutions. So finding these sustainable patterns is a challenge. So how are we doing? Well, not very well. If you look at the amount of publication on climate change or for every positive article you see, and there are some 
some um, bright spots. There's, there's many negative ones, so we're not doing too well. And uh, this is a report from, from Krausman at Alcantara, I can't remember the exact source. Uh, we've actually been quite productive as a global society in terms of taking natural resources and turning them into economic activity. So arguably over a decade we've seen an 8x increase say, in, in ore extraction, and that's delivered an 80x increase in GDP. So on the face of it, that's, that's actually pretty good. But if you go up a couple of levels, we're not doing so well, and this is uh, from the Global Footprint Network. If we continue at even modest growth rates, you know, by 2050 we'll need two Earths worth of resources. And, that's, and Jose Maria figures, I think he was the president of um, Costa Rica, said there is no planet B. And the idea of this Plan C came about actually in a dialogue with Eamon Ryan in Ballyvaughan at the Climate Gathering. Um, Edward de Bono wrote a, wrote a very nice book, it's called A Handbook of Wisdom. And the first page actually um, sets out a, you know, an interesting problem and the question is how do you start, stop somebody going from a point A to an unattractive destination B? You don't want to get them to B and of course the answer might be you build a wall or you, you, you physically stop them. And of course, the, 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 the smart answer, the lateral thinking answer is, so to stop somebody going from point A to point B, you give them a more attractive point C destination. And what Plan C is all about is, instead of taxing and fining people and trying to coerce people into more sustainable behaviors, uh, you actually give them a much more attractive future that they, they, they willingly adopt. So that's the basis of Plan C. And we've been talking about this since the first um, climate gathering, it got some traction at the, um, uh, the, the, the G8 summit. And very simply, uh, what it is, it's about creating attractive solutions that are more efficient, or more convenient, are more resource efficient, and often cheaper than the solutions that users have today. It's about using collaborative intelligence and collective action. It's about de developing and diffusing sustainable patterns. I'm sorry this has sort of crept <coughs> off the, the screen, but it, it also is about a mind shift in mind a mindset shift, and uh, one of my colleagues at Intel, Tom Stanley, says we solve too many problems using fines and taxes. You know, let's, let's try putting some alternatives in place. So Plan C is about finding at attractive alternatives. And we think there's a way of doing this. We see three mega trends, um, digital technologies or information technology, mass collaboration, and sustainability. We've talked a little bit about the need for sustainability. And we, we think Plan C can be enabled through this new innovation paradigm that's emerging called Open Innovation 2.0. Uh, one, just the only thing I'll say about mass collaboration, the European Internet Foundation is a collection of forward-looking MEPs um, in Europe, and they produce, uh, produce a report, actually, I think it was in 2010, talked about our digital world in 2025, and they identified all of the trends that we see, cloud computing, big data, et cetera, et cetera. But they said the mega trend or the dominant paradigm that we'll see over the next 10 to 15 years is mass collaboration. And we already see that at a relatively superficial way, the interactions in terms of Facebook and YouTube and users are now prosumers. Well, we're seeing an awful lot of machine to machine collaboration going on. So we can take, take advantage of this. We can take advantage of information technology. Moore's law, we're doubling transistor density at every 18 months and that's been delivered at lesser eco cost. Oh, and by the way, it's getting much more energy efficient uh, as well. And if we, if we look at this report from the ACEEE, basically looks at the energy efficiency that we've seen in different industries over the last 30 years. And we've had significant improvements in, in agriculture, in, in sort of automotive. Philips have done a fantastic job catalyzing uh, lighting, more than 300% energy efficiency improvement. Uh, but if you look at uh, computer systems, which is down at the bottom here, 2.8 million percent energy efficiency. So that's orders and orders of magnitude, you know, better performance. So is there an opportunity um, to take information technology and substitute for other resources? Well, we certainly um, think there is. Now, without being sort of Pollyanna and saying IT is the answer to all of our world's problems, we also have our, there is some dirty laundry in the IT industry. Our data centers aren't very efficient, so this is uh, one study uh, from an EPA um, study back in 2007, and we're doing a lot better than this today, but at that point, for every 100 watts provided uh, into the data center, depending on how heavily or lightly loaded the servers were, maybe 1.4 watts of power was actually used in, in the processing power. 
Now, there's been a lot of improvements uh, today, and there's a, a measure that we call PUE that has been dramatically you know, approved and there's the, um, improved in this European Code of Conduct. So the industry is making a lot of progress to fix this problem. And we can also use the technology. This isn't an advert for Intel products, but if you take, uh, for example, uh, um, big data problem, a pterosaur that today takes about four hours um, on a you know, standard um, server, just by applying technology that's emerging you know, almost on a daily basis, you upgrade to a slightly faster processor, you use a solid state disk, you use a gigabit ethernet, um, interconnect, and so on, you can get that four hour sort down to 10 minutes. So you get a 50, 50x performance improvement and you do it at a lot less energy. So you can actually, there are some problems in the IT industry in terms of consumption, but you can use a very fast rate of uh, progression of the technology to, to mitigate against that. One thing that re really isn't spoken about is, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the data center, but the big problem in terms of the IT industry is the wireless uh, cloud. And this is a report, just a, a finding from the University of Melbourne, the seed center there, that data centers are 9% of the problem, but wireless networks are the big problem. And if we look forward, 90% of the energy uh, that's consumed by IT is gonna come from the wireless clouds. And that's the equivalent from now to 2015 to putting about five million new cars on the road. So that's not insignificant. But it is insignificant in the context of all the other energy that we burn across society. And the real opportunity, what Plan C about, is about, is the big slice, the big green slice here, is here taking IT and this dramatic improvement in performance and substituting it for other activities in other areas of society. And at the core of this is the idea of uh, resource decoupling. So we'd all like global and individual GDP, or well, I guess no, individual sort of you know, incomes to grow, out, grow up and national and global GDP to grow. We'd of course like standard of life, our standard of living to, to improve. Um, if we are to do that in a sustainable way, what we need to be able to do is bend the cost curves on resource consumption and on an environmental impact and, and, and degradation. And we think that's possible using information technology. In fact, there's some very well-known patterns that are in place, and if they could only be applied more systemically and widely, we, we could get quicker to this more um, sustainable trajectory. So we've talked about, well, some of the effects of ICT on environmental sustainability. We know there are issues. I've shared some of the issues in the industry. But we really get to see sort of benefits Immediate benefits, you know, for example, online banking, we don't have to go to the bank. Um, so, you know, um, video conferencing, you know, Cisco, they tore their telepresence system. You know, they have their travel budget in a matter of a year through widespread deployment, and they get to see a lot more customers. Well, the real impact is in long-term socioeconomic changes in terms of energy intensity, greenhouse gas intensity, transportation intensity, and, and material intensity. Um, so we have to be a little bit patient but if we deploy these solutions, we'll see dramatic changes you know, here, here on the bottom line. And I want to give you one simple example at the end of my talk, uh, which is a trial we just completed outside UCD. Uh, some of you that live around here will know Roebuck Downs. And together with the ESB, we ran you know, a reasonably significant electric vehicle trial. And I'll share the results with you at the, at the end of my talk. There's lots of data. This is a McKinsey report that says the, the impacts of this, I think this is quite conservative, the abatement um, effects or impact of I ICT, if it's deployed correctly, will be at least five times better or than the, the impact or the environmental impact of ICT itself. So how might we do this? Well, we can automate, we can substitute, we can dematerialize. We are all familiar with examples, uh, digital music, online banking, digital books, and so on, where we have examples where we've been able to digitize and we get more convenience, it's cheaper, and it has a smaller environmental impact. And we could look at quite a few industries, industries that have existed for 100 years and they've been transformed uh, over the last 10 years. You know, I know using a Kindle, I can buy a book whenever I want it, I have it forever. You know, we don't have the, you know, the, in terms of the life cycle of um, impact on the environment, it's, it's much lower and so on. So there is a pattern emerging, whether it's online banking, it's digital music, it's digital books. We see better convenience, better service, it's more energy efficient, and very often it's cheaper. So this is a classic Plan C type solution. Why wouldn't I adopt a solution like that? It's cheaper, it's more convenient. We have some big changes that need to happen. 
the smart grid will need to be transformed. Our cities will need to be transformed. Uh, cities are really important because very shortly we'll have 70% of all of the global population living in cities. And cities are dirty, they are congested, but they're actually quite environmentally and resource um, efficient. We know agriculture is going to change, cars are going to change, and it's very encouraging to see the adoption of um, electric vehicles um, in, in, in Palo Alto. And each auto manufacturer knows their business is going to be disrupted. They have to change their business model. And in the future, instead of trying to maximize the number of cars they sell, they'll have to actually maximize the, the length or the longevity of the asset and the utilization of the asset. And, and these are all good. But all of these changes that are going to happen, there are fantastic opportunities to actually drive transformation and to make these solutions more sustainable. Um, but we need a methodology. And one of the methodologies that we've been working on with the European um, Commission and other stakeholders is something called Open Innovation 2.0. And it's a new paradigm. And this is, this is a whole other talk. Um, this is something that the Innovation Value Institute at the National University of Ireland in Maynooth has been practicing uh, over the last five or six years. And we have a lot of competitors working together. And this institute is prospering. And it's driving, trying to drive a structural change in the way companies and governments get value for, for information technology. It's a good example of this open innovation 2.0. But it has also produced what we call a sustainable ICT capability maturity framework. So today you can take an assessment of your organization, be it a university or a company, and assess how well are you using ICT to drive sustainability in your company or, or business. So if you're interested in taking that assessment, I'd encourage you to go to ivi.ie. We introduced this Open Innovation 2.0 paradigm at one of the, the thought leadership conferences of the Irish presidency called Open Innovation 2.0. And we've identified 20 different characteristics or snapshots of what Open Innovation 2.0 is about. It starts with the idea of a shared vision and shared value that collectively we're able to articulate a shared vision. And then we can actually articulate uh, how shared value might be created for the different players that are involved. Uh, we use quadruple helix innovation. This is where governments, industry, academia, and indeed citizens work together to actually drive structural changes far beyond what we can achieve on our own. We talk about explicitly creating and managing an ecosystem. We talk about co-creation. We talk about adoption. We talk about exponential technologies and, and, and so on. If anybody's interested, I can provide references uh, uh, to this material. But two areas where we're actually using this approach, one with the city of Dublin. In fact, I met with, um, we met with the city this morning in, in Dublin, and we have built an infrastructure. And we've actually co-created a platform that hopefully will get Dublin to be on a trajectory to be a, a sustainable connected city. Uh, in fact, we're using Dublin as a petri dish for London, where we work with UCL and Imperial, and we also have a shared vision with the Greater London Authority, with the UK government, the Applied Research Agency, how London can be the future city of the world, and actually how both in Dublin and London we can you know, fix problems and we can generate then solutions that are exportable and we can create um, an ecosystem and employment of both Dublin and, and London around this whole new green industry. But any major change, I think, needs a vision. Um, this is a famous one from Alexander Graham Well. This is probably the most famous one, John F. Kennedy. This decade will put a man on the moon and bring him back safely. I think what we're missing um, in this whole global community around sustainability is a, is a compelling vision that people will buy into. And it's not a vision that people actually are fined and taxed into. It's so compelling. Uh, that they actually do it sort of, you know, naturally. So we have a couple of activities ongoing, inspired in part by what Jeffrey Rifkind, or Jeremy Rifkind has done, you know, in his book, The Third Industrial Revolution. We're trying to articulate, well, what might be a vision of the future? And this doesn't much look like a, a vision, but one of the key ideas in, in this slide <coughs> is the idea of a value cycle rather than a value chain. Today, um, if you go to business school, you get taught about the value chain. And the way our world operates is you take a raw material, you transform it, you sell it, you use it, and then you throw it away. Well, that's not very sustainable. Umar Haig in London at the Havos Media Labs, he's been talking about the idea of a value cycle, the idea that we could um, create a, a, a cycle where actually you're able to um, regenerate resources faster than they're consumed. And the whole idea of renewables, and if we just take sort of the uh, the electricity value chain, there's a great opportunity to do that. 
And ultimately, if we're able to do this, we create new services that are more energy efficient, but we're also able to, to create jobs. And I want to give one example uh, where we're sort of in the early stages here in Ireland. We have a vision, Bob Metcalf, um, who was the founder of 3Com and the inventor of the uh, Ethernet. He talked about the idea of an internet, and that's where the internet and the energy grid come together, and you get these bi-directional flows. And end users, as well as being consumers, are also generators. So here, here in Ireland, we actually have a collection of companies that are working together using this Open Innovation 2.0 methodology to make Ireland the first you know, living exemplar um, of the internet. And we have, these are you know, real people. We have you know, one of the drivers is um, Sean O'Driscoll, the CEO and chairman of Glenn Dimblex. ESP Network CEO is in there. We have the CEO of Airtricity. CEO of Airgrid, uh, Finton Sly. So we, we have a vision. Now we're trying to figure out how do we make that happen. We already have a number of pilots uh, that have been you know, working. We actually have some, some interesting results. And I want to just share one of the, these results just to prove that this idea of Plan C and the theory, it might look nice, but it actually has real results. Uh, through a collaboration, you know, that you mentioned SAP in, in Palo Alto, we work with SAP in Belfast, and they, they basically sell their products to about 90% of the world's uh, utilities. And we did some very nice uh, research with them, not too difficult, but we figured out we could introduce, and that's my, my warning, so I'll finish in the next minute, I promised here. Uh, we figured out we could introduce about a quarter of a million new electric vehicles onto the roads of Ireland without any increase in generation capacity or actually in, in improving the grid. And we ran a trial here in, in Roebuck Downs, which is you know, about a, probably a kilometre, a kilometre and a half from here. And in those contribution, we developed this product called NLive, uh, Energy Live. It's about aggregation, it's about predicting, it's about optimization, and it's about actuation. And what we try and do for the individual homeowner is actually figure out how we can manage your requirements and make them as convenient and most energy efficient. And then we also use, at the national level, swarm optimization. So we're able to aggregate all of the requirements and then actually come up with a load plan and a charging plan that's best for the country, best for the renewable energy conditions, when is the wind blowing, and best for individual consumers. So what were the results from this trial? And think again about Plan C. We want to do something that's more convenient, that's more resource efficient, is, is cheaper. Well, what we've been able to do with NLive and People's Homes, we have um, a prediction engine that 95% of the time gets it right. What are the journeys you're going to take tomorrow? So instead of you even having to think about when you charge your electric vehicle or fill up your car, it's done automatically seamlessly in the background using ambient intelligence. But the most important thing, I think, in terms of actually coming back to you know, the, the point around how do you get people that aren't interested in this agenda on board is the cost reduction. So what we saw for each electric vehicle user using this technology and this system, you know, 44.5% reduction in their charging bills. So typically, consumer research shows you have to be you know, 10 or 12% price reduction before you get people interested in switching. But for me, that's a no-brainer. If you get that level of reduction, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sign right now. So we have a very significant benefit. And there are other benefits through smart charging. Electric vehicle batteries are the big cost, or 50% of the cost of the car. If you can increase the length or, of the lifetime, that's a big benefit. Um, if we can actually charge when the wind is blowing, and you know, occasionally here in Ireland, 50% of our energy is coming from the wind. And we know we have problems when we go beyond that. And Mark O'Malley here in UCD is working hard to figure out. So how do we get that 50% limit up to 70%? And Ireland has an opportunity to, to really be a leader, leader in that. Um, we've been able to increase the distribution network capacity and improve the quality of service. And very often, I don't know if you saw this in Stanford, but sometimes you actually have to upgrade the local grid when you deploy electric vehicles. But what we saw in Roebuck Downs is we could increase the capacity for EV penetration just by this smart charging and without having to, to lay any extra wires or, or put in any other kit. So I think this is just a small example, but I think it's quite a compelling example of how we might be able to, to, to realize Plan C. I wanted to finish with this uh, quote um, from Dennis and um, Donatello Meadows and a few others. Man possesses for a small moment in time the most powerful combination of knowledge, tool, and resources the world has ever known. We have all that's physically necessary to create a totally new form of human society, one that will be built to last for generations. The missing ingredients are a realistic long-term goal that can guide mankind.
Society and the Human Will to Achieve That Goal. Well, that was written more than 40 years ago. I think it's even truer today uh, than it was 40 years ago. And the question of how we call is, the technology is ready, are we? Thank you. Thank you.